this is a small recording of the address I gave in the teachers club at AIA's 5th anniversary on Saturday the 19th of March 2022. My address to the assembled. I'm delighted to welcome so many young people. I hope our message and mission is taking hold. Our message is simple, to free up young minds to learn from our history. <clears throat> Always giving respect for the sacrifices of those who gave their lives for Irish freedom in the counter-revolution. Our mission, to establish the People's Republic denied by murder and execution by the collaboration of native capitalists and British imperialists. Supplied with military equipment and finance, the British composed the treaty and overseeing the constitution of the free state. You have the luxury and gift of hindsight. Do not squander. In some sense of loyalty, the memory of the fallen. Take it from me, they were turning their graves if you were to repeat without learning from our history. Best tribute and respect you can pay them is to take up the fight and take back what is inherently the property of the Irish people. AIA is not a talk shop, we are proactive. We most certainly will discuss our decisions. But our action will not be discussion. Our centuries of subordination, we need to free our minds. James Connolly called it the awakening of the slave. Shackles are necessary to restrain the physical body but unnecessary when you enslave the mind. Every single person is born an original, but most unfortunately will live and die a copy. Otherwise, history would not keep repeating. James Connolly said, we must stop thinking in the lines and grooves those who want to rule us wish us to think. But the system's media is a formidable influence on our morality and emotions. The most recent example is in the Ukraine. War has always been a horror and the inhuman suffering of ordinary people caught in the middle of a power game between competing superpowers. It is not the first and will not be the last. But in the Ukraine, it's striking and almost a monopoly on human suffering. When you consider the continuing suffering for years of the Palestinian men, women and children and many other countries, and of course, the human catastrophe in the Yemen. I would like to think when the suffering stops in Ukraine, the same empathy and support and supplies of medical, food, clothes and armaments. And as one of the longest colonised ourselves, some modern armaments would be welcome to drive foreign occupation from our shores. But I know it will dry up. The Israelis are the cause in Palestine. The Saudis are the cause in Yemen. And the British here. And neither will be so prevalent in the media, papers or TV. Society and its values are controlled by those who own the media, 
the ruling class. Our emotions, morality, law, our focuses, sympathy, empathy, is directed where they wish to distract away from their control program of economic war. But they are but the tools of the money class. Their quarrels are not dictated by sentiment of national pride or honour, by, by the avarice and lust of power on the part of the class to which they belong. The people who fight under their banners in the various armies or navies do indeed imagine they are fighting the battles of their country. But what country has the ordinary people ever profited from foreign conquest? And ironically, the example they can give is when the British returned in 1918-19 and they went back to their workplaces and they were fighting for better wages and conditions. Their ruler and master, Lloyd George, wishing to crush what he perceived as a revolution on his own soil, was contemplating dropping bombs and machine guns. But our internal economic war is waged, shrouded in eloquent language to confuse ordinary people and grossly insulting with such phrases that we are all in this together. We pay for everything, that's their plan. The debts of the bank speculators under the USC which I prefer to call the utterly stupid citizen policy. Andy Kenny stood up in the rich man's club in Leinster House, proudly declared we pay our debts. Is it not clear by now, after the century of the free state, as custodians of the privileged national and international imperialist, the whole electoral system is working to our detriment. Intentionally designed to undersupply our basic needs in housing, welfare, education, etc., creating an environment of hostility, jockeying amongst people for their basic needs, thus preventing unity of purpose amongst people. But there is also another agenda creating dependency. A plan to compromise people's principles in introducing a sense of dependency. It is not new. They learned it from the British. When they were trying to expand out from the pale, believe it or not, they were complaining about the cost of building garrisons and soldiers to, to, to secure their plunder. So they came up with a plan. They would allow the defeated Gaelic Irish to remain on their land as tenants. The terms and conditions were they would recognise the King of England as their sovereign and be responsible to enforce his will, policing and securing their spoils. Does that not remind you? Of the British Treaty of the Free State, and for that matter, the Good Friday Agreement. Terms and conditions similar. Wolfe Tone in 1796 set about undoing the British stranglehold by uniting what he described as the Protestant dissenters and the Irish defenders. He said the British ploy was to convince the Protestants they were the Catholics' masters, but as he said, they were only their jailers. No country can be free until all the people are free. 
So there is obvious division is their strength and their weakness. That is where the political system feeds and strengthens and division is its bedrock. Their task is to convincing people they are not responsible for the shortfall, but they will help them jump the queue and get them a house, a medical card or whatever service they need ahead of others. When they have convinced people of this, they have sown the seed of a sense of voluntary corruption and bought their silence and dependency, believing there was more deserving in the queue, but eternally grateful to the conniving political system. It starts with the vulnerability of the most needy. Then up through the system, from the parish pump to Leinster House, the rot is embedded throughout. Speculators and privatisation, the path is laid. Government departments ready to assist. Laws on the back burner ready to enforce. If there is any public protest brought set to the greed driven enterprise. <clears throat> we have past experience to prove this. At a time, if you reported a burglary, the common response was, we have no car available, we will get to you as soon as possible. But if they got a call saying people were preventing the installation of water meters, 10 plus cars and 30 guardi in a matter of minutes, political policing of what? During the water campaign, we were before the courts on many, I should say, multiple charges. We chose a legal firm to consider our defence. At this point, for a few new people to protest, I think it's important to mention some very crucial points. Discipline is key. We decide our plan. Everyone follows to the letter. You may ask why. Simple. Experience in such matters dictates. You must not sidetrack the point of protest. No verbal abuse or threats. No waffling, no violence. The reason is simple. If you go before the courts and haven't conceded to the aforementioned, they must state why you were arrested in open court and try you on your political actions and your defence must repeat your objections to whatever the campaign is highlighting. Alternatively, they will just charge you with violence or whatever else, and the whole purpose will be lost. We have people of great experience in this room, in a, from shell to sea, the Moor Street occupation, the Citizens' Injunction, people providing a cordon to prevent developers entering the building to demolish. The Apollo House occupation, KBC occupation, bring it to the doors campaign, anti-eviction, housing campaigns, Tony Taylor, special courts, anti-internment, land grab, the list goes on. But to return to the water campaign, we decided to clear the decks with our legal team and explain we saw how we saw matters and not to waste time on them or us. No semantics. We explained our campaign was to prevent the installation of water meters, believing every meter was a meter closer to privatisation. We said we understand law is your chosen profession and you must work within its parameters. But as far as we are concerned, that same law is an impediment to protecting our natural resources, in this instance our water. They took this on board and found breaches from the company law. 
My reason for rehashing the water campaign is to draw your attention to the challenges before us on our various campaigns. Let it be our natural resources, housing, healthcare, etc. I read somewhere, I paraphrase, if campaigning for people's civil rights and entitlements is deemed illegal, then you are probably ruled by criminals. I believe this is a realistic assessment. Why else would you think there would be so much human deprivation, inequality, injustice, law protecting the stripping of our natural resources, etc. If not the robber class making the law to protect them and all their ill-gotten gains. Presently, there is a huge amount of bill to rent by a few speculators. It is staggering. They will soon dictate the price of the rental market, all in agreement with government policy. This is our challenge, to break this cabal of national and multinational greed, pure cannibalism. No point in ring fencing if the free staters are opening the door and granting them license to rob. Only a revolution can dislodge this whole rotten system.